This afternoon, our conversation with Jeff and Ron will address the continually popular notion of the struggle between science and religion and how this perceived conflict has influenced different religious communities as well as our popular culture and intellectual discourse. To host today's program and moderate this conversation, I would like to introduce John Dahl. John serves as an InterVarsity campus minister at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has served graduate students, faculty, and staff at UW for more than 20 years. Prior to his campus ministry work, John worked for the USDA and other units of government as a resource conservationist. He has a degree in agricultural engineering technology from UW Platteville and a master's in theological studies from Regent College at the University of British Columbia. John has been a member and leader at Blackhawk Church for more than 20 years. He is married to Julie, a faculty associate at UW-Madison Continuing Studies, and they have two sons, Eric and Hans. As a part of his campus work, John studies UW-Madison as an institution and enjoys researching its history. He likes working on houses, cars, and bicycles, but he enjoys nothing more than folding up in a rocking chair with a good book such as the warfare between science and religion. So <laughs> please join me in welcoming to the stage John Dahl, along with our speakers, Jeff Harden and Ron Numbers today. Thank you all. Feels like some kind of summit in here. <laughs> Go ahead, gentlemen, have a seat while I introduce you. So um, thank you, uh, Melissa, for that very kind introduction. Uh, let me introduce our speakers for you today as well. So Jeff Harden in the dark sweater, is our professor and chair of integrated biology at the University of Wisconsin here. He holds a PhD in biophysics from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MDiv from the International School of Theology. His numerous research articles focus on the genetic regulation of cell movement and cell adhesion during embryonic development, which has broad implications for understanding human birth defects and cancer. He is also a nationally and internationally recognized biology educator and the senior author of a widely used cell textbook, The World of the Cell. Jeff is the only scientist in the Religious Studies Department here at the UW, where he is director of the, uh, also a director of the ISMA Society, which is committed to promoting dialogue between science and religion. And by the way, the ISMA Society is something that Jeff and Ron uh, cooked up uh, some years ago, along with Ron Binsley, if he is in the house. If, uh, Ron, are you here? Not yet. All right. Uh, Ron Numbers, uh, to my immediate left, is a Hilldale Professor Emeritus of the History of Science and Medicine and of Religious Studies at the University of Wisconsin, where he has taught for nearly four decades. He has written or edited more than two dozen books, including The Creationists, Darwin Comes to America, Galileo Goes to Jail, and Other Myths About Science and Religion, and Newton's Apple and Other Myths About Science, all published with Harvard University Press. He is a past president of the History of Science Society, the American Society of Church History, and the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science. Please help me welcome. <laughs> so the way this is going to work is that I am going to ask them some questions, some of which they know are coming to them, some of them I'm going to uh, surprise them with. Be ready, gentlemen. And um, at 1 o'clock, it'll be your turn. We'll have a couple of moderators walking around with uh, microphones. So during our Q&A, I'd like you to be thinking about the best question, the best question that you could put to our speakers today, all right? So be pondering that one. And remember, not a monologue. So I just want to say that now. There's a handful of pastors in the room here. We all know how we operate. All right, very good. So, uh, Ron and Jeff, I just got done reading uh, your uh, credentials, your, your academic biographies, and they're really quite impressive. Uh, for the sake of our audience, for those who don't know you well, could you, in a few sentences, just say something about your spiritual biography or commitments along the way? Jeff, would you mind starting? Sure. Um, well, I am a Christian. Um, I've been one since middle school. and. Um, uh, but along with being a Christian since middle school, I've always wanted to be a scientist. So the job that I have at UW-Madison is a dream job for me. I'm like a kid in a candy store every day because um, I have the privilege of discovering new things uh, about the world that God has made. Um, 
Uh, John mentioned briefly that I'm a little strange and that I did my undergraduate work at Michigan State and then um, uh, took a slight detour to do a Master of Divinity degree, uh, after which I did my PhD at Berkeley. So for me, it, there's always been a, a strong desire to think about the interface between science and religion, and in my case, Christianity in particular. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I have been involved with the Religious Studies program here at UW-Madison, um, which in the early days was filled with many uh, people who uh, think about religion as it impacts other spheres of thought as an avocation um, alongside their, their day jobs. Um, I, I've always had a, a desire to, to uh, help students think about these things uh, because uh, they are vitally important for students as they navigate their own way in thinking about their own faith commitments and particularly Christian faith. Well, <clears throat> I have a more checkered background <laughs> than Jeff does. Uh, I, I started out uh, on the straight and narrow um, in a family of fundamentalist preachers, uh, attended uh, schools, uh, Seventh-day Adventist schools through college. Uh, I probably have the humblest academic background in this room. I, I am a proud graduate of Southern Missionary College in Tennessee. There's probably no one here who's even heard of Southern <laughs> Missionary College. It's like the Harvard of the Chattanooga area. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I don't think it was mentioned, but uh, the one thing Jeff and I have in common besides our interest in science and religion is that I too got my PhD at, at Berkeley where my faith started waning, uh, and um, I guess uh, the best label that I could put on my belief system is that I'm, I'm an agnostic. Um, I just have come to the conclusion, and came to the conclusion many decades ago, that the questions I had been really striving to answer didn't have answers. But I retain my interest uh, in religion uh, as an academic study, and especially as a historian of science, I focused, and historian of medicine, I focused on the intersection of uh, those areas. Mm -hmm. right, thank you, both of you. Um, so you two are an unlikely pair to put together a book. Uh, you, know, you can think of a joke that begins with a historian and a scientist walk into a bar. And uh, that kind of story. So how did your collaboration come about? Well, uh, part of the genesis of this is that, that Ron was uh, very involved with the religious studies program here mm -hmm. uh, in the early days that I mentioned when uh, the composition of the religious studies program on campus was a bit different. Um, it was a, a convocation of people who have interests in the intersection of religion with, with the discipline. So, in, in Ron's case, history, and, and in my case, um, biology. And um, so I think that's where I got to know Ron was through some of those religious studies meetings. And then we were also on the board of something called the Lubar Institute for the Study of the Abrahamic Religions mm -hmm. for a while. And uh, so we just seemed to keep running into one another. Um, and so that's how we got to know each other initially. But maybe you want to take it away as to how we got more deeply mired in this whole well, area. I was going to mention that uh, we really got to know each other pretty well when we founded the ISMA Society. And uh, about a decade, we got a small grant from the Templeton Foundation, and once or twice a year, we would have an event. Um, something like this without the food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then the the... Uh, reason for this book, uh, if I remember correctly, is that Jeff was becoming more and more prominent uh, in science and religion studies, especially with BioLogos, um, of which you were chairman of the board, is that correct? Yeah, still true, yeah. Uh, sure. And um, wanted uh, to establish himself more visibly and 
said something in the effect, if you to the effect, join me, um, I'll come up with the money. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up. It's, it's I funny that came. I remember these things slightly differently. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he came up with a hundred thousand dollars, as I recall. So if you want to have somebody do the fundraising, here's your guy. Uh, well, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Issachar Fund who um, supported the initial conference in 2015, out of which this book arose. Uh, without them, and especially um, their event planning uh, coordinator, Sarah Merrilies, this would have been impossible. Mm -hmm. So it is true I had something to do with that, and uh, that was due to a conversation with Kurt Behrens, who is um, uh, one of the, the key uh, leaders at the Issachar Fund, which is sponsored by the Blankenmeyer family. And, um, and I believe they're based in Tennessee, just so you know. Oh, interesting. So, All right. So, so. Yeah, good things do come out of Tennessee. <laughs> and, and how did this guy make his money? Uh, well, you know, I'm not totally sure how he made his money. <laughs> we should know. We should know. This is like Watergate. <laughs> Follow the money. See yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Okay. So, Ron, what is the thesis of the book? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish with this book? It's time to think about that. Huh? <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, well, as we can explore, if you if you want to, the notion of uh, conflict or warfare between science and religion uh, has been. Uh, very popular since the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that numerous historians of science and religion uh, have pretty much destroyed the idea of uh, constant conflict, I mean, there have been problems along the way, um, it hasn't gotten to the public. And the subtitle of the book is The Idea That Wouldn't Die. And I think it would, you would be hard pressed to find any uh, trained historian in religion who still uh, promoted that idea. And uh, for one project, I actually did a survey uh, to make sure that the, that the contributors to another volume on science and religion weren't, weren't overly biased. And I think about, uh, 50% of them uh, self-identified as atheists or agnostics. Um, and you had a handful of other, you had some liberal Christians, some evangelicals, a, a Muslim. Uh, so it's not a group of apologists who mm -hmm. are, who are doing, doing this work. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should mention uh, one of the most distinguished uh, uh, historian in this area who was vice chancellor uh, at Berkeley, John Halbrook. Um And uh, he wrote a book about the history of astronomy uh, in the late Middle Ages, early modern period, especially solar astronomy, and has in that book that uh, no institution provided more social and financial support for astronomy for 600 years from like, you know, the 13th mm -hmm. to the 19th century um, than the Roman Catholic Church. And it's ironic that right in the middle of his period is the Galileo Affair. Mm -hmm. And the Galileo Affair, which is widely misunderstood, uh, has actually come to symbolize the long-standing relationship between science and religion. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a colleague here, is he here, Mike Chank? No, he has some better things to do. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, Mike Chank is, a, is an emeritus professor of the history of science here. And he extended Halbrun's <laughs> generalization to say that for all of natural philosophy hmm. for 600 years, that was probably true. Wow, that's really interesting. So, so the, the short answer is that we just wanted 
to get the fruits of historical scholarship mm -hmm. uh, out there. Uh, and so we temporarily, we, we baptized Jeff as a historian for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just Yes, yes, you may. Yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a scientist, so I... You want to be. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, man. I really do. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned, I'm a Christian. This, let me just read something from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Church of Colossae. He says this. Um, he, he's talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So as a scientist, I've always thought that that is a charter for doing science, that being a Christian and um, having a personal relationship with the one um, who is responsible for everything that we see is a huge opportunity because um, for me, being a scientist is an act of, of worship, really. So I was always puzzled by this notion that there is this ineluctable conflict between science and religion, mm -hmm. and frankly frustrated by the polemical use of really a sort of historical straw man in thinking about this. But I'm not a historian. And so uh, I really wanted to hear from the world-class historians on this point. Now, I think the other thing that is a bit unique about this book, maybe it was a vain attempt, Ron can address this, but um, my idea was to bring sociologists into the mix too because they analyze current thinking in various populations about science and religion and are they in conflict. Mm -hmm. So to have the people contextualizing the historical situation and then connecting to the present moment and people who analyze the present moment, uh, I thought would be very valuable for me personally. Mm -hmm. So for me, this has just been an incredible experience to be involved with this group of incredibly smart, talented people. But I think then also the, the hope is that this will trickle out into the wider uh, world, uh, the, the, the fruits of this work. All right. We didn't fail. We have the last two chapters in this book are by the two most distinguished sociologists of science. John Evans, who grew up here in Madison, his father was a, was a chemist here, some of you might, might know him, and Elaine Eklund at Rice University. So we did get the very best. That's pretty good. So you have historians and sociologists in the room together working on this, and I enjoyed those chapters. Um, you know, in terms of methodology and where they start, how they think about their fields, that kind of stuff, how did the conversation go between the historians and the sociologists? I can imagine there'd be some uh, interesting conversations about how do we proceed. It went well. I have known both Elaine and John for many years. Mm -hmm. I've collaborated with them on other projects. Uh, and um, we talk the same language. Um, so there was no conflict between the sociologists and historians in and terms zoologists. Of, in term, and, and yes, one, the one token zoologist, that's right. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the, um, uh, these two groups do tend to run in different circles most of the time. Now, John Evans is very interesting because John Evans has a strong historical sensibility um, that he brings to the sociological work that he does, I think, um, and, uh, and some of the other sociologists who were there are in touch with the historians, so um, uh, one of the contributors was looking at the way certain textbooks use the warfare thesis in the uh, introductory textbooks for undergraduates, and he's a sociologist, but he's directly in contact with Peter Harrison, who is a very eminent historian of science working in this area. So, so I think the, the group that we picked was predisposed to, to do a, a really good job of talking to one another. All right, that's great. Now, when it comes to the audience, uh, we put the word out and we have 75 plus people in the room, so evidently you did something right, but can you talk a little bit about who was your intended audience? Who, who were you hoping to reach with this? Right here. There we are. Um, I see a stack of books over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's a, it's, a, it's a really great book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you can get free autographs, even. Um, <clears throat> we, we aimed uh, strenuously uh, to convince our colleagues to take their specialized expertise and make it palatable for non-experts in the field. And I think, by and large, we were successful. I'm really sorry uh, Ron Binsley isn't here. He was co-editor of the volume and uh, did a lot of uh, heavy lifting to help translate some of these works into <laughs> accessible language. Um, that's what we were trying to do. All right. Yeah, in a way, I'm the canary in the coal mine because if I can't understand the historical chapters, that, that's, a good, that's a good measuring stick that maybe they're at a little bit too high of a level. So we, you know, we really wanted this book to be useful to, um, to people in a way that they could just pick up a chapter and, and read it and not be overwhelmed by detail. Okay. I'm curious, what was the most difficult for you to understand? Um, you know, historians have a way of talking about particular historical incidences in the past using insider trading language that is hard for people from the outside always to appreciate what they're doing. Like, you know, you'll, you'll look at, at Larry, let's say, who wrote the, the, uh, one of the introductory chapters, and, and you guys will use some phrase about something, and, I'll, and you'll, like, smile knowingly at one another and I'm like, what? What just, what just happened there? So, you know, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of that with, with people who are um, used to talking about things. It's true in science. Like if, if the few oh, no, are on the other foot, yeah, we, we, we have a lot of technical language too. So, so I think de-jargonizing some of that is one of the virtues of these chapters. And, and, and Ron Binsley, I think, was really important in helping to smooth that out. Um, yeah, kudos to him. So we're going to pull the room here, and uh, please be honest. How many of you have actually read the book already? Oh, this is really helpful. Okay, thank you. I should have asked that at the front end. We should raise our hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ron, you, you mentioned that when it comes to the warfare of science and faith, that something happened in the middle of the 19th century, uh -huh. and uh, that's when the warfare between science and religion break out. Why did that happen, and how did that happen? Well, I'm going to say something very counterintuitive, uh, probably especially to Jeff, but um, science <laughs> didn't become science until the early 19th century. Uh, when the term scientia was used, it was a synonym for knowledge. And it wasn't until the very late 18th, early uh, 19th century that science was captured by students of nature to represent knowledge of nature. And until that time, uh, what the fields that we now consider as scientific were broken into three areas. One is natural philosophy, which in, included topics like physics. Mm -hmm. uh, one is natural history, which included most biology and geology. Um, and then uh, some medicine. I mean, most physicians weren't cultivating knowledge, but you did have a number of medical schools that were trying to, trying to participate uh, in this. And the one idea that brought these groups together and created what we now uh, call science was that in exploring nature, uh, you had to restrict yourself to natural explanations. Even Isaac Newton, the greatest natural philosopher of the late 17th and early 18th century, was open in appealing to God. Mm -hmm. And in the 19th century, when uh, these people who were just starting at mid-century to be called scientists, that too was a, was a new label for men of science, uh, and it was men of science back then, just about exclusively. Um, so this was done, <coughs> excuse me, by mostly by Christians. Mm 
And what it did was level the playing field. It didn't make any, <coughs> excuse me, it didn't make any difference. Oh, thanks. Uh, where the, oh, boy, oh boy. <laughs> Talk about being blessed. Right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, to you. Yeah, now I'm better. It didn't make any difference uh, what your beliefs were, whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant or even some proto-fundamentalist um, or not of the Abrahamic faith. Um, as long as you tried to explain nature uh, naturally, mm -hmm. uh, that was acceptable. And so you have conscious efforts to edit out any uh, theologi theological statements, uh, and uh, people quickly learned that they weren't going to get published uh, in the major scientific journals if they appealed to the supernatural. And um, now this didn't stop scientists hearing their religious convictions. They did so they wrote popular books, they gave sermons in some instances, uh, they wrote for religious journals on, on their personal convictions, but very almost abruptly you see uh, the disappearance of God taught. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Jeff, do you want to speak to that at all? Well, I just wanted to say that one of the historical, well, I'll let Ron weigh in on this, but one of, the, one of the key themes throughout the book is that there were two writers in the late 19th century, Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper, who wrote specifically trying to, um, uh, well, they were advocating at least, maybe in a, mostly in a polemical fashion, to, to, uh, to kind of create this notion of conflict. So one of the themes throughout the book is to what extent was this idea picked up and what are the threads in various religious and scientific communities? Uh, how is this, the work that these two gentlemen did at the beginning or at the end of the 19th century um, carried forward into the 20th and uh, early 21st century? So, so that's one thing. The other thing I would say is that you also have at this time an approach which was considered by some to be scientific in the new sense of this word, as Ron mentioned, in terms of dissecting um, the sacred texts of uh, the Judeo-Christian traditions of the Bible. And so you have this kind of secular dissection approach to the uh, Hebrew and, and Greek scriptures that are the basis for the Bible alongside this um, uh, naturalization of approach uh, among scientists who were writing at the time. So these are kind of coming together. Um, and one of the interesting things I think about the book is analyzing to what extent was, were these things also antecedents to this notion that there must be conflict. Um, and, uh, you know, different traditions pick up on different themes here. Uh, I would say that the whole um, Andrew Dixon White, John William Draper, um, trope is maybe, turns out to have less historical importance than some of these other things uh, in, in the perception of conflict going forward. Okay, thank you. So to either one of you, um, those of us who are following what's going on in the uh, New York Times book review and so on, paid attention the last 10, 15 years, there's a rise of the new atheists. Uh, you've got Sam Harris, uh, Chris Hutchins, and, and others uh, who are making a lot of hay on this kind of uh, conflicts. He says, what would you say to them if they were in the room? I'd say, read some history. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Jeff and I collaborated on the chapter in this, in this volume on the new atheists, mm -hmm. looking at, at their writings historically, and especially examining the extent to which they were knowledgeable about or incorporated the historical research of the past 40 or 50 years. And um, most of them just totally ignore it or disparage it. Uh, and so it clearly has had 
virtually no uh, impact on the new atheists. It goes contrary to what they've been claiming uh, for the last couple decades. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think one of the interesting things about putting together that chapter is they just assume conflict. Yeah. They're not actually interested in going back and determining whether uh, and to what extent there was conflict. To them, it's just self-evident there, there must be conflict. And if you, if, if you don't show that there's conflict, then you must have an ulterior motive of some, some, some sort of conciliation. So my friend Ron Numbers uh, was a given a, a, an interesting appellation by Jerry Coyne, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Chicago. Um, and Ron was considered the Neville Chamberlain of religion <laughs> and science by, by Jerry Coyne. If you know your history uh, leading up to World War II, that will mean something to you. Mm -hmm. um, sorry to bring back that memory, Ron. But, that may uh, have been one of the kinder things. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I think it, it, that's an interesting point. I was expecting them to cherry pick historical incidents. They actually don't do that. They just assume that there has mm -hmm. to be conflict. So for history for them is not particularly important. Like there are no lessons to be learned there. Right. Um, be, because we don't need any lessons to be learned. We, we, this is just something that is patently obvious. So, you know, so when Richard Dawkins says, Charles Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, I mean, that's a metaphysical statement. Um, and they tend to do that a lot, not just when it comes to evolutionary biology, but also to the history of the interaction between religion and science. Mm. Right, thank you. Ron, you mentioned that uh, a lot of work has been done in the last 40 or 50 years between the relationship between science and religion. What have been the findings that have happened in the last couple of generations, um, the historians of science? What have you guys, what have you men and women dug up uh, in this regard? Uh, it could be boiled down to one word. Complexity. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in a way, it's a little simple-minded, but in, in contrast to people uh, who assume that conflict existed consistently, or, and there is another group of people who believe that Christianity gave rise to science and, and that, uh, that that should be celebrated. I mean, what we found is that, not surprisingly, uh, almost every story is far more complex than anybody had, had imagined. I mean, you can read some pretty horrible stories about Galileo, <coughs> but as the uh, records of the uh, Inquisition became open and scholars became going day to day through, through the records, uh, they discovered uh, that uh, the myths about Galileo mm -hmm. uh, didn't typically hold up. And I could take a minute or two to summarize what... Sure. So probably most of you know Galileo uh, misbehaved and wrote on a topic he wasn't supposed to write on. And in January of, uh, of uh, 1633, he was summoned to Rome uh, to go before the, the Inquisition. Uh, when he got down there waiting for trial, he was put up uh, in the Tuscan embassy and uh, he treated as an honored guest. And then just before the trial, when he had to move into the palace of the Inquisition, uh, one of the officials of the Inquisition vacated his multi-room apartment so that Galileo and servant could move in. And Galileo didn't even have to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, eat the food of the Inquisition because the Tuscan chef from the embassy would uh, cater his, his meals oh, wow. while That's he's there. Now, a little known fact about Galileo is that he had become a cleric in the Catholic Church. Hmm. He had even been tonsured. Uh, and there were rules governing what you could do uh, to clerics. There were rules governing what you could do uh, to the aged, and he was ill and aged. Um, and there were rules governing um, uh, 
when you could torture somebody. For example, you had to wait uh, a number of hours mm -hmm. after eating. Uh, that was sort of like, like swimming. <laughs> oh, <what>? Sort of <laughs> like swimming. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Although this was uh, to keep things clean and hygienic. Uh, oh, gotcha. There. Okay. Um, so you put everything together. Uh, almost every hour is can be covered. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, uh, but it seems highly unlikely that there was any physical uh, torture. Uh, there may have been some mental stress, although I don't think there's any reason to believe that he feared for his life. Uh, and um, afterwards, uh, he uh, went to Siena as the uh, guest for a few weeks of the uh, Archbishop of Siena, mm -hmm. then went home to his villa outside of Florence. Um, he was under house arrest, uh, but his daughter lived nearby and he, he could receive guests. So, and and uh, he was very fond of Sangiovese wine, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's every reason to believe that he imbibed. Uh, <laughs> so, it's not a good story. He, he was suppressed, mm -hmm. but the idea that he came within an inch of his life, that he was physically tortured, all, I mean, it makes the story sound great, right. uh, but uh, there's very little historical truth, if any, to it. This is where I'm going to insert a plug. After one of Ron's uh, collaborative books, it's called Newton. Apple and Other Myths About Science. Um, if you're looking for the next book, uh, that's a really fine one. It's uh, short chapters, I think there's 24 myths altogether, and Ron has a particular kind of gift for debunking uh, conventional wisdom about different sorts of topics, so I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that one. I think the other book in the genre uh, co-edited by Ron is, is, has the title Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths, and, and so if you want something more about Galileo, that's a, that's a great starting point. That's right. And you could hear that he was just aching to tell you details about this stuff. So that's, uh, <laughs> aching. That's aching, that's right. So uh, uh, this is final question before we go to the audience. So I hope you've been thinking about your question. Remember, the monologue. So uh, Jeff, Ron, there are probably atheists in the room and probably Christians in the room who have been raised to think that the relationship between science and faith really is oppositional. Um, who keeps promoting this notion of conflict? That's a great question. Uh, certainly on... It, I want to be very careful about something because I have many colleagues at the university who would not have any self-identified faith commitments, and um, some of them might consider themselves atheists, others agnostics, but the new atheists, this is a particular group who is uh, seeking to promote a particular take on, on atheism, and that group certainly is part of the perpetuation of this notion of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very vocal, and they get a lot of press, or have at, at least. Uh, maybe I think the amount of press they're getting appears to be waning, I would say, uh, substantially. Um, we could talk about that at some point. Um, but so that would be one group. And I think the other group um, are certain uh, people with strong religious commitments. Uh, Christians, so there are certain groups of Christians who assume that mainly, in part at least, as a reaction against the new atheists and, and other kinds of things, um, believe that mainstream science ha always has an agenda, and always has an agenda that seeks to denigrate people of faith. And um, so... For my brothers and sisters who are in that category, I, I, I just, um, I don't feel that as a Christian who is a scientist. I'm, I've been department chair in my department for, this is year 11 now, so my, my colleagues certainly feel that they have some, um, that, that I'm a reasonable colleague, at least most of the time. Now, I don't know what they say around the water cooler when I'm not there, but, um, but it, I, I think the, the notion that there's some sort of institutional bias against uh, 
um, religious commitments is, is, is difficult to support. And yet, um, this serves certain purposes in both of these polar opposite camps, I think. So there's an excluded middle that um, doesn't have anybody speaking for it. Mm -hmm. And I think we want to try to create some space in that middle for uh, fruitful dialogue. Mm -hmm. Well, the most uh, popular uh, creationist organization uh, associated with Ken Ham uh, has a large creation museum, which I've been to a couple of times, and just two weeks ago, I made a pilgrimage to Noah's Ark. My goodness. Yeah, and um, <laughs> it, it was a spiritual experience for me. <laughs> uh, but you, you get the decided impression at sites like that, that uh, science has undermined the Bible story of creation and, and, and the flood. Just another uh, tip of the hat to John Evans. He has a book that came out within the last year where he's the sociologist from, from Madison at UC San Diego um, that's titled something like Morals Not Knowledge. And looking at conservative Christians, uh, he, he found, not surprisingly I guess, but most of them except science, most of science. Mm -hmm. And it's only, uh, if you ask for you know, the chemical composition of the water or something like that, there wouldn't be a disagreement anywhere. Ron, it's H2O. <laughs> Damn. It's always helpful to have a scientist in yeah. the <laughs> um, so, But it was only in this subset of scientific claims that uh, came in contact with moral values, mm -hmm. that they were suspicious of, of science. Okay. As we, uh, we have Melissa on this side and Becca over here, they're carrying the mics around. Uh, before uh, they hand it off, just we know some of you need to teach uh, that kind of thing, so if you go ahead and do so quietly and just make your way around the back if you would. We'll try to finish up around 120, 125, no later than 130 for sure. So do you have questions that you'd like to put to our speakers? We'll start over there with uh, Stephen. If you would, please stand uh, and uh, tell us your first name and address your question to Jeff or Ron, please. I'm Stephen. I teach chemistry here. Uh, my question I think is probably going to best be directed toward Ron. Um, as you're looking at history of science and its interaction, most of the descriptions you gave were of of uh, the Western world and its, and its pathway through this interaction. Is there any parallel or, or direct opposite of a parallel, a skew relationship with, say, the Arabic world and its um, history of interaction between religious, religion and science that we might extract some lessons or dialogue tips from? I can give a fairly short answer, which I should do, and that is uh, I also co-edited a book called Science and Religion Around the World, trying to compensate for the lack of knowledge uh, about uh, non, the non-Abrahamic faiths in particular. Um, it covers Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam, but also uh, uh, other cultures. Uh, so I recommend that book. Co-edited with one of the leading historians of science and religion, John Hedley Brook. Some of you may be familiar with his work. It's certainly true that trying to define a relationship between Islam and science is like trying to define one between Christianity and science. You have to talk about a particular take on Christianity or Islam. Um, uh, one, th I think, thing that's interesting, and Ron has done a good bit of study in this area, and um, Elaine Howard Eklund presented some of her work in this area at, at the conference that led to the book, um, is that there's been some exporting of particular views uh, of, of, uh, associated with young earth creationist uh, approaches to understanding science and the Bible towards conservative elements within Islam. And um, so that's an interesting recent development. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. 
not really. <laughs> One of the most problematic areas of the world uh, is Sub-Saharan Africa uh, before Christianity arrives. And what do you call science? What do you call religion? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you, you know, they did some uh, healings. Uh, they did some agricultural work, uh, uh, some in mineralogy. Uh, but do you say anything that resembles science today was science back then? And you really don't have much to deal with until the missionaries get there and start introducing so you can make some connections there. Interesting. Uh, the, just, I'll just want, add one other thing. Actually, um, I'll, I'll call out Beth Winowski, who's in the front over here to my left. But before the, the, we got started this afternoon, she was pointing out that some of her students, her Islamic students, tend to view the Quran, Quran as predicting everything that we know from modern science. So you can find everything that we're talking about in modern science in the Quran directly. It's an interesting approach to the Quran. Um, and that's, that's kind of interesting, um, that uh, that's not something that Christians tend to do with the Bible, or, or, or the Jewish tradition doesn't do that with the Bible in general, I would say. That's interesting. Let's, let's have a question from this side of the room. Um, I'm Carrie. Is this on? Okay. Um, I just ask your help um, with the subtitle of your book, the, An Idea That Won't Die. If, if there, you can comment on how this idea can die in time for us to have a livable planet. And that is the warfare I see between some um, scientists and, not, and many Christians about climate change. That's your hair. <laughs> no, it's not, actually. Uh, where's Rick Lindroth when you need him? He's apparently uh, in the state of Oregon today, my friend from the entomology department who thinks about these things. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So, so Ron talked about, in a couple of contexts, about the notion that some Christians have that science is trying to undermine the Bible. So if you accept that notion, then this creates a huge inherent skepticism about the scientific establishment. So if the scientific establishment agrees about something, then you're going to have inherent skepticism towards that. So in the area of climate change, this, this really comes to the fore because there's, there's a sense that this is part of uh, an attempt by certain scientists who have uh, perhaps a political agenda in other areas to to uh, climate science. So, so there's a, a huge problem there of building trust, I think, with certain constituencies within the um, Christian church, especially in North America. Um, and so you have people like Catherine Hayhoe, who's coming here, I believe, um, next month, uh, who is... She's at uh, Texas Tech University, and she's a Christian environmental scientist, and, and she'll address some of those things. Um, the, the rebuilding of trust has to happen first. I think if you simply say, here's what the evidence shows, why don't you understand it? That will not work because, and this is true in, in other areas of biology that are more germane to what I do on a daily basis. If, if, if you don't build trust, then there, there is complete lack of openness. There's a refractory nature mm -hmm. to uh, how certain faith communities will approach um, what seem to be well-established notions coming from, from modern science. So um, rebuilding the trust is an important thing. I think showing, uh, defusing the conflict thesis maybe is helpful there because if you can help people to see there hasn't been a centuries-wide agenda against Christian faith or other faith communities. You can't find that. So if you help people to see that, maybe it helps to dial down the heat and hopefully dial up the light in some of these conversations. Okay. Good question. Thank you. On, on this side? <clears throat> or, Hi, uh, Kermit over here. Um, she stole my first question, so my next question is more of the... Uh, 
historical nature. Galileo is kind of like, that story has been kind of a iconic myth for the conflict. What are some other stories that have contributed then to that myth and how are those outweighed by the research that you've done? <laughs> um, there, uh, there are a lot of them. You probably expected an answer like that. But um, you go back, uh, one of the common uh, examples from the Middle Ages was that uh, Christians taught that the earth was flat and uh, consequently uh, Columbus and his sailors were scared to death that they were going to go off the edge of the earth. The truth is that all educated people, virtually all educated people since antiquity, uh, believe that the, that the earth was a sphere. Uh, and you can find uh, some, uh, and this wasn't even typical of Eastern Orthodox, but you find uh, uh, some Eastern Orthodox people in a period who are saying that, and then people like Draper and White then pick it up and generalize to, to uh, all of, all of Christ, Christians. Um, the uh, Pope uh, condemning uh, human dissection uh, gets included in some political discussions uh, today. Um, certainly when you get up Toward, uh, toward modern times uh, that uh, um, Darwin single-handedly destroyed the idea of, of design. Mm -hmm. uh, design flourished uh, in the late 19th and, and 20th centuries. Uh, so things of that nature. All right. On the side? Uh, my name is Jeff, and I'm a Christian retired professor, physician scientist from the med school. Um, and um, I'll ask my question, but I do have to do a couple sentences explain why I'm asking it. So my question basically is, if I can read my own writing, because I'm a doctor, I may not be able to. Um, viewed from, the, from a spectacle, uh, skeptical postmodern perspective, do scientists ever propagandize because of fear that the divine will get a foot in the door and their honored position will be challenged? Okay, and being on this campus, you can say, God deliver me from postmodernism. But anyway, the reason I ask this is what's typically portrayed, if you were going to a, a nature show on public TV, there'll be a guy with a glorious baritone voice talking about evolution, disavowed, disavowed. And the impression is always given that it's just a matter of simple mutations and natural selection. And I think today we know that that paradigm, if that is the neo-Darwinian paradigm, is kind of defunct. Uh, if you look at people like, uh, uh, I wrote them down here, Eugene Koonin came to mind, or James Shapiro, University of Chicago, They've essentially said this. Uh, James Shapiro talks about uh, naturally occurring bio, bioengineering within the cell. So we have huge amounts of complexity to the point that, you know, my research area was from uh, immunochemistry, cellular immunology, medically important fungi, and application. Um, you get an impression when you're actually working there that you feel overwhelmed because you're trying to study this incredibly complex piece of information and structure. And, and a lot of what we do as biologists today is really a study of information. And the complexity gets more and more and more complex. I won't go into all that, but I think people get my point. So why, you know, if you're kind of skeptical and you look at this, why do we keep because I really think there's a tendency to portray this very simple-minded thing to the public. Maybe that's because I think the public's simple-minded. But it also has this kind of 
propagandizing flavor to it, which I don't think is particularly healthy. And I don't know how we get out of it. So that's my question. Well, there was a lot going on there, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how the postmodern postmodernism comment at the beginning fit into most of what you said after. Postmodernism, basically, you know, there is no truth. And we just have meta narratives, and we're power hungry, and we, we put these and we enforce them. So scientists are telling this simple-minded story so that the public doesn't realize oh, okay. that, that it's, and, and, and Kunin and, and Shapiro are both agnostic atheists. But Shapiro has said that we keep telling this simple story to people because we're, we're threatened that if we really look at the complexities, then they'll, they'll start wondering about the whole naturalistic paradigm. I guess that's mostly directed at me. Um, I so, think so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, so I, uh, from one Jeff to another, I think I want to say that um, there, some of the things that you say are probably right. I would probably characterize it as, as a modernist tale uh, coming from science. Um, you know, there is a sort of primordial ooze to Albert Einstein kind of narrative that often runs through science exhibits. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think uh, the, the Carl Sagan approach and then Neil deGrasse Tyson in the remake of Cosmos especially, he just, um, he is trying to construct a narrative. There, I think there's no question of that. So I actually feel that we need more good, um, Christian theists or other people of faith doing science popularizing who don't have the same narrative construction agenda that, that DeGrasse Tyson seems to have to, to balance this out. I think, I think that is, is important work. It's not always valued maybe in the church, but I, I, as a Christian who is a scientist and who writes textbooks, I'm keenly aware that there is a temptation to construct a narrative when you're presenting certain ideas in cell biology, for example. So, so I think I would agree with you there. I, the other thing that I would say is it's certainly true that modern thinking about um, evolutionary biology, we're, we're in an interesting time right now um, in that uh, I think there, um, there's uh, some disagreement about where the edges of the mechanisms of evolution lie. I don't think there's disagreement about um, uh, the evidence for evolution, um, um, but there's a really healthy debate within the scientific community, and it doesn't really involve, I mean, there are some theists involved, but it actually doesn't involve theists most of the time, about how we should think about what's called the extended evolutionary synthesis, for example. So, so you're right, that doesn't tend to come through in nature documentaries. So David Attenborough is not going to talk about the extended evolutionary synthesis <laughs> Um, he's going to look at breaching humpback whales, and isn't this amazing, you know? And, and um, so to the extent that, that the nature documentary is inculcating a sense of wonder, I'm totally on board as a Christian who's a scientist. Um, but I do get irked sometimes by um, slipping in these extra narratives that aren't well supported by the science itself. And I think if you have your antennae up for that, that's a very appropriate response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to take one more question from over here. And then uh, if you have other further questions you'd like, we're going to turn the thing back over to Melissa and her team. And then please come on up and talk to Jeff and Ron afterwards. But please, go ahead, Jim. Thank you. I'm Jim. I'm a pastor here in Madison. And Ron, in one of your earlier answers, you alluded to a line of Christian uh, argumentation that Christ Christianity provided the conditions for the rise of modern science or that somehow Christian pre presuppositions are are necessary for, uh, uh, for the, the, the work of science, the ordered creation, that kind of thing. I was wondering if you could expand on your thinking on that historically or theologically. That is a difficult can of worms, actually, uh, because uh, without doubt, uh, we see instances in the past of Christianity uh, and other religious faiths, uh, inspiring uh, scientists, if you'll let me use the anachronism, um, 
perhaps uh, pushing them toward one career over another, uh, perhaps uh, them uh, to focus on some particular uh, natural uh, phenomenon. Um, but I think very few, if any, uh, historians of science and religion now uh, would make sweeping claims about uh, Christianity being a necessary uh, presupposition for, for doing science. Um, there are a few people out there. Um, I mean, Rodney Stark, a sociologist of all things, um, <laughs> has been pushing this idea pretty strongly in, in his writings. Uh, but I'm, I can't think of a historian of science and religion uh, who's, who's been promoting that idea. But neither would they deny that Christianity had any role. Okay. Jeff, Ron, before uh, we finish, do you have any concluding remarks you want to make? Anything you want to say by way of uh, just tying things up here at the end? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and amen. <laughs>